Coming home from work, I went to the post office, and as usual, my box was full of junk mail and bills. I flipped through them and tossed most of them in the trash can next to my desk. Between the visa application and the bill from Conoco lay an envelope, written in a flowing handwriting I knew all too well. I'd been getting one letter a month for over a year. She guessed I was getting mail forwarded from my old address, so she wrote and sent letters there to be forwarded to me. I met Pat at a wedding reception. A guy I worked with was getting married and the whole office was invited to the wedding. After the wedding, everyone went to the reception. I had been there for about an hour when this tall blonde woman walked in. She was getting everyone's attention and was definitely getting mine as well, but she wasn't alone, so I put her out of my mind. Well, not really put her out of my mind. The hall was small, so she was in sight most of the time. Maybe another hour went by, and I noticed that she seemed to be getting more and more upset with her date. Right after the bride and groom cut the cake, I got up to go to the bathroom. On the way, I had to pass the table where the blonde was sitting. As soon as I got to the table, I heard her say, Bastard! As quietly as she said it, it sounded like it was addressed to me, so I turned to her. I beg your pardon? She blushed and said, It's not to you, but to that worthless piece of work, my beau. All he does is drink. I've been trying to get him out on the dance floor since we got here, but all he's done is drink, and now that lump has left me. I guess I deserved it, though. That's what I get for going on a blind date. Relieved that she didn't think I was a bastard, I made my way to the bathroom and then back to the table I shared with a few co-workers. The next time the orchestra played, I glanced over and saw her watching the dancers and stomping her feet. On a whim, I stood up, walked over to her, and asked her to dance. She said yes, and that was the beginning of a torrid affair that resulted in our marriage three months later. Patricia Ann was a computer genius and worked for a large corporation as a systems administrator. She tried to explain to me what she was doing, but I am computer illiterate, so it all went in one ear. I know how to turn on my comp and how to log on to the internet, but that's the limit of my computer savvy. I make my living as a heavy equipment mechanic, and I'm pretty good at it, so soon the two of us had saved enough to put a down payment on a house. We had a great marriage, at least I thought we did. I was madly in love with her, and she certainly felt the same way about me. But in the sixth year of our marriage, something changed. When it started, I couldn't determine with any degree of certainty, and it could have gone on for quite a while before I noticed. Patty always left work one night a week with the girls and was usually home by nine. I didn't notice as the time grew to 9.30, then 10, then 10.30, and it wasn't until later that I remembered those evenings. Patty started working late a couple times a week, usually on Tuesdays and Thursdays. She attributed this to an unexpectedly large contract with critical deadlines. They weren't equipped to handle such a large order, and until management made some decisions about which way to go, everyone was asked to work overtime to get the order. Decisions? I asked. What kind of decisions? They want to make sure the contract will be long-term before investing in more equipment and hiring more people. And how long will it last? Maybe a couple months. I don't know exactly. A couple months stretched to eight before I started complaining about it, to which she always responded calmly. It doesn't have to be that long, baby. I know you don't like it, and I don't like it either. I don't like dragging boxes around the platform, but I promise to help. And then one Wednesday night, she called me and told me she had to work late. Anne was supposed to work tonight, but she had an accident and is now in the hospital, so I would have to fill in for her. The next morning at breakfast, I asked, what about Anne? Patty looked at me in confusion and then said, Anne, ah, yes, Anne, not really. They have her in a stretch. Both legs and one hip are broken and she's going to be out of work for a while. The poor thing is having a heck of a time. She went on vacation with her boyfriend, and before it was over, he told her he found someone else. The airline lost her luggage on the way home, and now this accident. So now you're going to be working overtime on Wednesdays? Yeah, and maybe even one or two Fridays. That's when I started thinking about things. Up until that point, her overtime was annoying, and that's all I thought it was. Just a stupid bunch of incompetent managers who couldn't get their heads out of their asses and solve a problem. It all started with the confusion on her face when I asked about Anne. It was as if she had lied, forgotten about it, and then had to hurry up and cover it up. And if that was the case, was she lying about having to work late? 
That's when I remembered the Wednesday nights spent with the girls from work and how they started ending later and later. I wonder what the computer guy is doing moving boxes on the loading dock. That Sunday, everything came together for me. I was doing routine maintenance on Patty's car. I changed the oil, added windshield washer fluid, and then decided to change a tire. When I opened the trunk to remove the spare tire, I discovered two suitcases. Curious, I opened one and found it full of clothes. The other was full of sexy lingerie, high-heeled shoes, and the like. Heels and lingerie I'd never seen before. I don't know who Patty wore them for, but certainly not me. So much for Patty working overtime. There could only be one reason for the multiple outfit changes and all that sexy junk in her trunk, and it certainly wasn't work-related. I'm a slow thinker sometimes, but I try not to be a fool. I analyze problems, run them through my head, look at them from all angles, and think through all the options before I make a decision. I finished bolting on the tire, closed the trunk, and walked home, determined to learn more before doing anything. Since it was the vacation season and things were pretty hectic, I put off following Pat until the end of the year. I didn't have to wait long, though. Patty's Christmas party was scheduled for Wednesday, and she was looking forward to it. I had a last-minute job that prevented me from going with her. She was upset. No, she wasn't. She was pissed off and took a big snap at me, and I was no better, yelling back at her. Now you know how I feel when you work overtime. I said I would try to finish on time so I could at least show up, but that didn't seem to calm her down at all. The day of the party, I worked as hard as I could to try to make it on time. The party started at 7, and by kicking ass, I was able to finish work, get home, shower, change, and be there by 9. I walked in and saw Patty hotly hugging and French kissing some guy while people were stomping their feet, pounding their fists on tables and yelling, Get a room, you two, and take your novel to the motel. I turned around and left, and no one even noticed I was there. On the way home, I tried to figure out the reasons that might have made her go looking for a man, but I never realized anything. For God's sake, I treated her like a queen. I did everything I could for her. I helped around the house. I cooked at least three times a week and cleaned up after myself. In the evening, waiting for her to come home, I did a load of laundry. I cleaned my den and the first floor bathroom next to my den. All this in addition to taking care of the house, yard, and both cars. I never forgot a birthday or anniversary. I remembered the day we met and gave her a card every year on that day. The same thing on the anniversary of the day I proposed to her. I never even looked at other women. I had done everything I could to be the best husband she could hope for. So what had gone wrong? The only thing I could think about was the 20 pounds I had gained in the last five years. Was that the cause? Was I no longer physically attractive to her? It didn't matter, though. What I saw meant one thing. We had missed our marriage. I loved her deeply, but not enough to make me share her, and not enough to make me fight for her. So what if I wrestled her away from this guy? Could I wrestle her away from the next guy? And the one after that? No. As much as it pains me to admit it, Patty and I are breaking up. But I've decided one thing. 20 pounds has got to go. I'm going to be fit when I start seeing women again. I've also decided not to get divorced. I'm never getting married again. And Patty and I get along just fine while she plays with her lover. So I'll maintain the status quo and save myself the hassle and expense of a divorce. All I have to do is pretend I don't know anything about her lover. That evening, back home, she was in a great mood and wanted to make love. It would have been unnatural for me to refuse her, and besides, I was curious to see if I could be said to be getting scraps in sex. Surprisingly, she felt the same as she had on any of the hundreds of other nights we'd had sex. But damn it all told me that I'd been the second man long enough. Though I wondered if she was trying to fuck me to death out of guilt, or was she getting a charge out of giving up the leftovers after her lover? I went to the gym on Monday, sat down with a personal trainer, and he put together a program for me. I went to the gym on my way to work on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and after a month, I started running on the weekends, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and only rested on Sunday. My relationship with Patty remained unchanged. She still acted like I was the one and only, well, I never showed that I knew extra. She still worked late, at least two nights a week, and I stopped whining about it. In two months, I had lost 18 pounds, strengthened a little, and felt pretty good. Marla and Sally, the two girls who worked with me in the office, both commented on the change, and Sally asked me what had caused it. 
I told her I was trying to get in shape to be more attractive to women. Oh, and what does Patty have to say about that? We have an understanding. Uh-oh, open marriage? Yeah. Well, stud, I'm ready if you are. That took me by surprise. I was always flirting with Sally and Marla, and they flirted back. I never expected it to be anything but flirting, but from the sound of Sally's voice, she was serious. What the hell, I said to myself. Go for it, Jerry. Knowing that Patty would be working on Thursday, I said to Sally, Are you busy Thursday? I guess I am now. What do you mean? It's up to you. Okay, I'll figure something out when you pick me up. A casual dress. I'll be there at 6.30, okay? Marla, who had been standing listening, suddenly jumped up with the words, I have seniority here. And Sally laughed. You overslept. You lost seniority. Now wait your turn. I arrived at Sally's at half past seven, and she appeared at the door in her robe. Am I too early? No, I'm already dressed for our date. And she opened her robe. She was naked, except for her stockings, high heels, and garter belt. I think we'll have dessert first, then dinner, and then decide what to do. We never had dinner that night, and I was a very well-slept-on man. Sally walked me to the door, kissed me passionately, and asked when we could meet again. I can do Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm available Tuesday and Thursday. I stopped by work on the way home, showered in the locker room, changed into my work clothes, and then went down to Bill's bar for a beer to keep me out of breath, then went home. When I got home, Patty was still awake. Where were you? Knowing you wouldn't be home, I decided to stop by the guy's house after work and play pool. I hope you didn't drink too much because I'm horny and want you. It wasn't easy for me to fulfill her request, but I managed it nonetheless. It took me a while to get my mind off the drink. I'll have to watch out for that in the future. I had completely forgotten that Patty always comes home excited when she is working late, and I must see to it that I leave some energy for her. For the next six weeks, Sally and I had sex hot and heavy, and then one night she told me, It's Marla's turn now, Jerry. What's up? This is our last time. I want Marla to take over for me. I don't get a vote? Yes and no. You have a say in whether you want Marla, but this is definitely our last time together. You're a married man, Jerry, and I can't afford to get too deeply involved with you. There's no prospect for me here, so I'm letting you go. Be a good guy, we'll stay friends, and I won't have to quit my job, okay? Do you think Marla really wants to? I know she's got a soft spot for you, honey. All you have to do is ask her out. And maybe that won't even be necessary. She knows we're stopping and she can come to you. That's exactly what happened. On Friday, Marla came up to me and said, I hear you have Tuesday and Thursday free now. Can I take them? My first night with Marla was almost a repeat of my first night with Sally in that we didn't leave her apartment at all. My affair with Marla lasted five weeks, and then she ended it for the same reason Sally did. I got too deeply involved with you, Jerry, and that's not good with a married man. They both said that if I were single, we could live together. They were both fun girls, and they were both great in bed, but getting divorced to be with either of them? Not serious? They both had an affair with a married man. Why would I want a girl like that? I already had one at home. Over the next eight months, I dated and slept with nine different women. None of the affairs lasted longer than a month, most only two or three weeks, but I didn't want anything long-term myself. My domestic situation hadn't changed. Patty still worked late a couple times a week, almost always on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So those were the meeting nights. I have no idea how much longer things would have gone the way they were going if it hadn't been for a strange coincidence. It was Wednesday, and I was at the gym. I had just finished my workout and was in the shower when the man who had been with Patty at the Christmas party walked in with two other guys and started changing into gym clothes. I turned off the water wiped myself dry with a towel and listened to the conversation between the three men. It sounded like the guys had gone from evening to morning. There was some work-related conversation that led me to believe they worked for the same company, though not necessarily in the same office. And then one of them said, How are you doing with that fox you were with at the Christmas party? Still sleeping with her? I keep telling you I'm not even trying to get in her pants. We're just good friends. Yeah, sure. I'd like to be friends with her, too. Hell, I'd love to be friends with her. Forget it. She's so attached to her husband, you'd think he was gold. 
Come on, Mike. I've seen you two hugging and kissing. Like brother and sister, good friends, hugging and kissing. Honestly, she's so hung up on her husband that no other man stands a chance. Bullshit, Mike. I saw you both at the Christmas party, and that kiss you exchanged was not a brotherly kiss. Right, but that doesn't mean anything. Her husband promised her he'd come, but he never showed up. She was furious and drunk on top of it. When she finally resigned herself to the fact that her husband wouldn't show up, she grabbed me and said, Damn it, it's a holiday party, and someone was going to kiss me under the mistletoe, and if it wasn't going to be Jerry, it was going to be you. That was the only time. I find that hard to believe. You want to know how obsessed she is with her husband? You know, all that shipping and overtime everybody's trying to avoid? She's working every minute to buy him a bass boat for his birthday. Most of what she and I do is her asking me about engine sizes, fish finders, and everything else she plans to outfit the boat with. I just hope the guy realizes what a gem he's found in her. Let's hurry up. I only have until seven to play. When they left, I sat down on the wooden bench in front of the lockers and stared at the wall. Oh my God, what have I done? I had completely misinterpreted what was happening and then let myself freak out. I was doing what I mistakenly believed Patty was doing. I was cheating. I was going behind the back of the woman who loved me and cheating and more than once and with many women. The only saving factor was that I didn't rebuke Patty. You cheat, so I'll cheat twice. Patty didn't know that I was cheating and that I obviously wasn't going to do it again. I would do everything in my power to make it up to her, even though she would never know. But it didn't work out. I just wasn't the kind of guy who could cheat and then go through life pretending everything was okay. I could act like that as long as I thought we were both cheating. But as soon as I found out she was faithful to me, it hurt me. I couldn't bring myself to look her in the eye. I couldn't even bring myself to make love to her because the touch of a cheater on her would defile her. I had really ruined my marriage and messed up my life. It was a very stupid thing to do. All I should have done in my day was to just walk up and say, this is what's going on and this is why I think so. And we could have talked it over. After the overheard conversation in the locker room, I had no doubt there was a reasonable explanation for the suitcases in her trunk as well. But it's not like I'd ever given her a chance to explain herself. I was totally screwed. I couldn't face her. I didn't have the courage to sit down and tell her what I had done and why. I was a coward, and I did what cowards do. I ran away. I went to my boss, told him I caught my wife cheating, and I was going to move on. I like the company, and like the work I do. And if you have an opening somewhere else, I'd like to move there. If not, I guess I'll have to apply. He picked up the phone, made a call, and there I was on my way to Colorado. I told him that my wife would probably be looking for me to cause me trouble, and I asked him to tell her that I had left without warning and that he had no idea where I had gone. The next day, while Patty was at work, I loaded all my stuff into the pickup truck. At the last minute, I wrote a simple note, I'm sorry, and put it on the kitchen table. It was disgusting for her, of course, but she'd get over it eventually. She deserved better than me. She'd be able to get a divorce as abandoned and move on with her life. It happened 14 months ago, and in those 14 months, not a day went by that I didn't think about Patty and what we had, and I had so foolishly ruined. Luckily, I had a lot of work. Work occupied my mind and hands for 10 to 12 hours a day, but the nights were killing me and waking up alone in the morning was murderous. When I first came to my new job, I decided to go to a bar after work and drown my sorrows, but that went away quickly. Going to work every morning hungover wasn't good for me, and the beer was ruining everything the gym and running had done for me. So I got in the van, found a local gym, and started getting in shape. After being there for six months, I noticed a few women who seemed interested in me, but I didn't take the initiative. My head was still full of thoughts of Patty, and I didn't know if the day would ever come when I could think of another woman. I opened my Conoco statement and saw that I had overpaid and gotten a credit, so I tore it up and threw it in the trash. I didn't open the visa application. I knew damn well I had no credit on that account and wouldn't make the payment until my next paycheck, so I put it in my pocket. I picked up the letter from Patty and stared at it. I brought it up to my nose and imagined I could smell her, then tossed it in the trash. That's it, came a voice from behind me. You don't even open the letters. 
You just throw them away. I turned around and saw Patty. Hey, Jerry, long time no see. I just stared at her. I couldn't even run away because she was between me and the door. Who bit your tongue? Well, I shouldn't be surprised. You've always been a man of few words. I got two words when you left, and I don't even know what you regret. All last year, I've been thinking. I'll never understand why you wasted an extra word. You could have done it with just one word. Goodbye. Come on, Jerry, say something. How did you find me? I won't. If you run away again, I may have to use the same method again. I'm not going to give you another opportunity to cover your tracks. The point is, I'm here. And I'm not leaving until I know everything. Not here. Let's go to my house. So what in God's name made you think I was cheating on you? You had all the classic signs of a cheating wife. Suddenly you're working late, even though you've never done it before. Increased sexual activity with your husband because you either felt guilty or your lover was winding you up by the time you had to go home, so your husband had to put out the fire. Or maybe it was because you were turned on by giving your husband your lover's leftovers. The evenings when you stayed in for drinks with your co-workers who kept keeping you later and later. Then I found suitcases full of sexy clothes in your trunk that you never wore for me. All of this, along with the fact that I showed up at the Christmas party and saw you tongue wrestling with a guy while all your co-workers were yelling at you to get a room and go to a motel. They wouldn't have said that unless they were sure you were lovers. It all came down to your wife cheating on you. You poor, stupid fool. Why didn't you talk to me? The suitcases belong to Anne. I told you the airline lost her luggage. They found it, but by then, Anne was in the hospital on a stretch and asked me to pick up the luggage. And overtime was real. All you had to do was look at my receipts. You're right about the increased sex being driven by guilt, but it was guilt for leaving you alone so often. I knew it bothered you, and I was trying to make it up to you. As for Christmas, it meant nothing. I had too much to drink. Mad at you for not being there to give me a Christmas kiss under the mistletoe, so I grabbed Mike. Yes, it was unnecessary. But if you had stayed, you would have seen us break up and go to different tables. And he didn't even dance with me the whole evening. God, Jerry, I can't believe you just left me like that and didn't even try to explain. That's not why I left you. I left because of me, because of what I did in return. And what did you do? I took a deep breath and told her about Sally and Marla and everyone else and how I'd managed to keep my marriage together because my cheating kept me on equal footing with her cheating. And then, when I found out you weren't cheating, my life just fell apart. I couldn't look you in the eye knowing what I had done to you, and I realized you deserved better than a cheating asshole, so I left. She sat there looking at me trying to comprehend my words, and then she said, How did you know I wasn't really cheating? I told her about the conversation I overheard at the gym. Her face went a little pale, and she said, Oh my God, what the hell? She kept looking at me and shaking her head. Let's see if I got this right. You thought I was cheating, so you were cheating to make us even, right? I said, Yes. And she continued, So, while we were even, you thought we could continue to live together and that everything would be okay. Everything would be fine, right? I nodded. It was only when you became convinced that I wasn't cheating that everything went to hell, right? I said again, yes. So if you never heard that conversation at the gym, we'd still be living together? Would you still be playing with your girlfriends while staying with me? Maybe. She stared at me for another minute, then asked, Did you love me? Yes, I did. I still do. The only reason I stayed with you thinking you were cheating was because I loved you so much I couldn't leave you. You know I love you, right? My coming here should show that. I was devastated when you left and I didn't know what led to it. I need you in my life, Jerry. I need you to come home with me or I'll move here to be with you, but one way or another with you, Jerry, with you, please. I can't, Patty. After all this, I just can't. Being with you is a constant reminder of what a cheater I was, I just can't look you in the eye every day knowing what I did. But would you be able to do that if I cheated on you? While we were even, you could look me in the eye, right? I nodded. Then come home, Jerry, because we're even. I cheated on you. You were right. You just used the wrong information, but you came to the right conclusions. On nights when I worked overtime, Mike and I slept like a couple of sex-crazed rabbits.
It started one night, just before we finished our shift. We bumped into each other, looked at each other, and it was like a sexual spark passed between us. He just grabbed me, flipped me over, bent me over a packing crate, and took me. And I let him. I didn't say a word. I just let him take me. After that, almost every night after that, when we worked overtime, he would catch me in a dark corner or behind a pile of boxes. I never said no. I never said yes. I just let him take me. It was fun sex, exciting sex, delightfully illicit sex, and I loved it. I loved the sex. Not Mike. It was just hot, illicit, erotic sex. I didn't even kiss him. That kiss at the Christmas party was our first and only kiss. I had a husband who loved me and drove me crazy and made fantastic, passionate love to me and had a part-time stud who treated me like a whore and made me love it. And then I went and ruined it. You ruined it? How? You started acting a little weird and I thought you suspected something. The overheard conversation was a setup. It was supposed to calm you down and keep you from knowing Mike and I screwed up. Instead, he broke us up. If I hadn't tried to cheat, we'd still be together. You'd still be with me thinking we were equals. Are you saying you're still going to sleep with Mike? No, Jerry, that's bitter irony. That fake conversation that turned you away from me also ended Mike and I's relationship. That night when we were working overtime, he brought the two guys he'd had the conversation with and told me it was all played out and now the three of them were going to have fun with me. So I left him. All I've done since that night is work and try to find you. I need you, Jerry. I'm not a person without you. Please, honey, can we put the past behind us and start over? We're acting like children. Can we please, please start over? I stared at her and my thoughts raced at a hundred miles an hour. I loved her to death and missed her so much that not a day went by that I didn't think about or want to be with her. But could I go through that again? She must have read my mind. It will never happen again, Jerry. I can promise you that. The last 14 months have been hell, Jerry. They've been the most miserable months of my life. Life without you is killing me, and I will never do anything to put myself through that hell again. Please, Jerry, I'm begging you, come back to me. At home or here, just let me be with you. There was really no question about what to do. I only ran away from her because I didn't think I was worthy. I loved her very much, and if she wanted me back knowing everything about me, I'd be a fool to refuse. As for her cheating on me... I had already come to terms with that when I started playing the stay even game. Can we? We should. She loved me enough to lie to me, portraying herself as the whore she never was. She never had an affair with Mike. She just told me that to make me believe we were even, to come home. How do I know that? I went back to my gym and one morning Mike walked in. I don't know why, but I looked at him for a long time and after a while he came up to me and asked, Do I know you? No, but you knew my wife well enough to have an affair with her. Hey, what are you babbling about, man? I didn't have any affairs with married women. Did you forget the affair with Patty Bradley? The hell I didn't. What makes you think I had an affair with Patty? She admitted it. I told her everything. He shook his head. I'd love to, but that Christmas kiss is all it ever was. It's not like I didn't try. The conversation you overheard is true. I don't know why she wants you to think I was her lover. All I can say is that I wanted to, and I tried like hell to make it happen, but she never even gave me a chance. Hell, I was stunned when I got that Christmas kiss. Will I ever tell Patty about my conversation with Mike? No, I'm not going to do anything that would tip the apple cart over. She did buy me this bass boat, and in a perverse sort of way, I named the boat and wrote the name in big gold letters on both sides. Every time Patty and I board Mike's fun, it reminds each of us how fragile relationships can be and how hard we have to work to keep them intact.